Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video view series. We take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the Tier 3 one-shot adventure, Tartarus Journey into the Underworld, designed by Elise Crittell for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. I have a very special place in my heart for uh, Greek mythology. Uh, both my kids' names are derived from Greek mythology, and uh, our two uh, youngest dogs are both named after Greek gods and goddesses. And I think a lot of people who are fans of the fantasy genre, I think you'd find a lot of that overlapping Venn diagram because Greek mythology was basically the the progenitor of the fantasy genre. It, it was the original, you know, swords and sandals epic. It was uh, the hero's journey. It was um, heroes battling giant monsters and getting magic weapons and doing all this just cool fantasy stuff. So it's not surprising that, you know, a lot of D&D &D stuff and monsters and everything and the pacing and all that is very much based on Greek mythology. I don't see a whole lot of um, the reverse content where people then insert Greek mythology back into D and D, which I think is a really cool idea. And this one is very much directly like one of the Greek myths. Straight up, it is the story of uh, Hades capturing uh, Persephone, uh, and uh, the whole you know reason why spring and winter exist because she was the goddess of uh, spring and all that. And then he kidnaps her as the asshole gods do and thus uh and she only returns to you know the material plane for half the year and thus we have spring and then winter um and in this case uh the players get a chance to uh free her by enacting a ritual and uh basically imprisoning hades and letting her take over the underworld which is pretty awesome and that manifests as a one-shot dungeon crawl <laughs> which i think is the right way to do it like that's a big story to tell uh, and you could go in a lot of different directions that way, but I appreciate that it's organized basically like you're journeying through the underworld. There's a whole lot of Greek myth stuff and should be a lot of fun Easter eggs if you are uh, even just tangentially aware of, you know, just like names and things. Or maybe you've played the recent uh, Hades video game because a lot of those characters and the storyline, everything going on there is, is very much derived, in fact, from this very specific story. Uh, the other unique thing that's going on here is this is designed for level 12 parties uh level 12 player characters and i don't see a whole lot of content for tier 3 and tier 4 out there uh which i think there's a a good need for that i mean a lot of the official 5e published adventures end at level like 11 or 12 or 13 so i think there's a lot of uh you know parties and and groups that are being left wanting to get that higher level content uh, and the way this does that is by utilizing Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes. My goodness. I don't know if the designer just flipped through that book and was like, hell yes, hell yes, hell yes. Because just about every monster here is like a unique, like tier three CR 11 or 12 monstrosity from Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes, which is pretty cool to see uh, and utilized in, in different ways, either as like random encounters or by utilizing like um, I think the gray render is used for Cerberus, uh, so you can just kind of reflavor it, which I'm a big fan of using stat blocks that already exist and just kind of, you know, re-theming them to make them look like something else. Uh, but it's a really cool idea. So if you're a fan of using monsters that are not just out of the monster manual, I think it does a great job. On the other hand, uh, unfortunately, it does not have any replacement suggestions like i've seen that a lot of adventures will do if they use monsters from uh, additional sources other than the monster manual because i think you can always assume people have the monster manual. i think that's a safe assumption for being a dm and running adventures um and frankly by the you know at this point in dnd's lifespan it's probably safe to assume that also have access to a lot of the uh, extra supplemental material but that being said I do like to see uh, if you're going to use those extra monsters, maybe offer some replacement suggestions that are more of the mundane monsters and maybe just say, hey, if you don't have this creature, then use this and give it this extra thing or something just that way um, to help people out that don't necessarily have that. But there should definitely be a 
uh, you know, kind of a, a warning label. It's like you, you really need to have more than kind of the Tomb of Foes to get the full breadth of the creatures and the storylines being used here. Um, the introduction is is the weakest part of this adventure, which I, I really think this is one of the better adventures I've reviewed this year. Honestly, I, I really love the the higher level uh, aspect of it, and I just I have a huge uh, fondness for Greek mythology. But the introduction did not grab me very well at all. It it focuses too much on explaining the Greek myth itself and going over all the uh, characters, which is fine. I like when we get you know role playing notes on characters or anything, but it doesn't tell me how does this involve the players? How do we get the players into this situation? Where where is their motivation? How do they how do they get transported into this world or whatever? Um, or if it's if it's a pure one shot angle where it's literally like you are just running this with completely separate characters who were like built for this adventure. I think it would have been really cool to, to give me some character sheets, you know, give me some cool, like, it would have been really awesome, especially if you were character sheets based on, like, Greek myth heroes or something and, and have, like, you know, characters, classes and everything based on that. But um, otherwise, adventure hooks basically is what I'm asking for. Like, why does this not have adventure hooks? Every adventure has some way to bring your party into this adventure. And it took me until I read the first couple pages of the actual dungeon crawl to realize, oh, we actually don't even get the quest until room five of this dungeon where you actually meet with Persephone and she tells you the whole deal about what's going on, which is an interesting way to uh, structure the narrative. So at first, your players basically don't know what the hell is going on, which can work, but again how like the initial room is just a lake you come across a we're gonna go to the map by the way um you come across like an old man in a cloak and he's fishing around for something he's dropped and you can help him or not help him whatever and it reveals that it's secretly somebody else who's an ally of um persephone's and is basically saying hey we need your help to break her out of the underworld and this happens to be a portal into the underworld right here that you can just go down into the water into this cave um that's kind of the whole like adventure hook that you have and then once you go in there you have to go a little bit ways inside before you actually do the whole riding on the boat with Charon across the lake of or the, the river of fire which is all very cool and then you meet with Persephone herself so I like that but I need some way like why why is the party at this lake like well you know what's the they were never summoned or given anything I, I feel like there was just a little bit of missing information there to, to to bring us from zero to okay we're standing at the entrance to the underworld uh, it's it's a little bit jarring for, for both DMs as me, like trying to read through the introduction going like, wait, how did we get here? And then obviously for players going, wait, what the hell's going on? What are we doing? Um, but once you get inside, it gets really, really good. And it's a gorgeously designed uh, document. It's got awesome artwork throughout, which is very much from, you know, Greek mythology and this really great full color map of the dungeon crawl that we'll be going on which is 14 rooms long and it does have one square equals 10 feet which i hate honestly you you maybe could get away with five but it's it's weird that it's such a big you know these have such large rooms as it is and then you're telling me you're supposed to double the size because D 5e does not work with 10 square feet foot rooms so that's a huge bummer but we get separate uh, player versions that don't have all these number annotations, gridded and non-gridded, like all, you know, high resolution, low resolution for VTT, like every kind of awesome uh, map variation that I could ask for. And it's a really cool art style. So it's still very much a positive uh, for me, for sure. Uh, and there's a little bit of a gauntlet section where you make it through, like there's a scary bit of the tunnel where it's just completely cut off and you're like suffocating, have no idea where you're going. Um, Charon is on the river of fire here. And if you go into this, the, the fire doesn't feel like anything. It's almost illusory. But then if you jump into it, because some idiot player is going to do that, um, you, you get transformed into like another Morden kind of monster, which is called the hungry. And it's something that the Persephone can cure if, if you actually, uh, uh, complete this quest, but otherwise the player could spend like the entire adventure as this completely other monstrous creature, which it says it's a curse, but honestly, I looked at the stat block and I was like, this is kind of like a pretty powerful creature here. I guess if you were a spellcaster, that would suck because you're just left with like, you know, multi-attacking with your your gaping maw and your claws, but it's, it's an interesting twist for a player. Um, once you meet with Persephone, she gives you the actual quest, which is we're going to perform a ritual that's going to uh, essentially trap Hades and then uh, Persephone can take over as her revenge for all these things and run the underworld better. Um, 
the goal is to just basically explore the dungeon. You have to perform um, these rituals at three different specific sites using this ritual dagger she gives you. I was initially worried that the whole thing was going to be very linear because um, it's designed that way. You really literally, there's no branching paths. There's one secret door you can find, but it's basically to get from the end of the dungeon back to the beginning. It's kind of a, conven a convenient like, you know, return to where you have to go to perform the climax. Um, but otherwise, it is quite linear, but I, I still appreciated the way each room is designed, and it still offers a good balance, a really good balance between uh, role-playing and socialization, exploration, and combat. Uh, combat could occur from all these different random encounters. Anytime you are resting, uh, there's a chance roll a d20 on a 15 or higher, you're going to get some combat here. And here we, again, get a lot of the Mordenkainens, the Grey Render, the Alps, uh, the Narzagon. Just, you know, occasionally you might see like ghosts coming by or something, but there's like, there could be a lot of combat here if your players are healing. Although you get these freaking vials from Persephone that heal like 12d4 plus 10 hit points or something, which is pretty insane for uh, powerful healing. Uh, the first room you get to is one of the other allies of Persephone, um, which is really cool room full of like uh, titans that are petrified and like half in the ground and stuck in there. And of course she tells you, okay, you need to go to the ritual and then come back here once you've activated the three different things, which involve essentially just touching or manipulating something while you've like cut yourself with this ritual dagger. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it satisfies the exploration angle pretty well. They're all, you know, there's Artemis is sitting there with a bow. I think it was Artemis. Um, and you have to figure out like which one she's uh, aiming towards and that's the the right tile you're selecting or, you know, you're raising a, a sword from a statue or something. It's nothing is real like puzzly or too challenging. Um, but there is combat involved in some of these rooms or there's ha uh, environmental hazards. There's a lot of fire. So obviously it's the underworld. So there'll be like, you know, fire on the ground or there'll be these powerful giant um, steam magma methods or whatever that can attack you. I think it's a really good... Uh, balance between all those different factors. What I really enjoyed is there's a little cool like side task that the party can do in the form of these three statues of the fates that you find scattered around different areas and like hidden alcoves and niches in throughout this dungeon. And about halfway through the dungeon, you'll find an altar that has slots for the statues, which is a cool idea. And it's, it's very much reminds me of a cool thing to, to add like to a video game dungeon where you might find like one statue almost on accident and then you come across this altar that's got slots for each three and you're like, oh shit, now I got to look out for these, you know, statues and go back and search and, re and really like uh, see, what's, see what this does if I put them all in there, if I want to be a completionist. Uh, and if you do, you get a pretty cool reward. You get a, the Shield of Artemis, which is very powerful. You get advantage on one-handed uh, attacks with your weapons. Just straight up advantage is huge. But I think that was a really cool like little side content you can do. And then they're spread out a little bit to where you have to really, it really satisfies that exploration uh, pillar very well because you have to do certain, you have to like drink a potion of diminution and make it through this one little, you know, small, air, like hidden niche in this other secret area below the prison thing. And then another one is across this giant pit. You have to get up to this like shelf and grab it, you know. Basically, it, it forces a lot of players to use like spells and think outside the box and use all their tools and all those things. So I really liked seeing that. Um, the ritual, if I was organizing this adventure, I would not have put it in room six, even though that's where it takes place. I would have rather put the ritual at the end because I don't want to read the end of the adventure in the middle of when I'm reading the dungeon crawl. That was actually really strange for me, even though obviously the way it's set up is yes, you do have the climax in this one room, essentially the the NPC that you're with stops and says, okay, I'm going to set up the ritual. You go through and activate those different things and then come back here and we'll start the climax, which is fine. That's a totally fine way to do it. Um, I would have just include, you know, include this, that information and then put all of this basically page on uh, information on page 12, which is all of the ritual information at the end, because that's when the players will have gone through the dungeon, activated all the things. And this climax is fucking awesome, really. It's just, a if you wanted like giant monsters at the end of your Greek mythology adventure, which you should, you're gonna fucking get this here. There's a really cool cutscene, which I don't know if this was a formatting error or what, but you know, you, we've got the like the read aloud text boxes here. Some of these paragraphs should be read aloud, like the way it's written, like a powerful wind begins to cyclone in the chamber as the weave begins to open, like, why is that not done as like read aloud text that needs to be read aloud? It's very, very well written and cool. Um, and essentially Hades gets summoned here uh, and then he uh, puts on the ring and he gets knocked out and then his uh, uh, 
uh, what's it called? Cerberus appears as, as the gray render stat block and attacks. And then because of the different, you know, earthquakes and things shattering, this nearby prison opens up, which releases a Cyclops and a giant. So you have to fight all these just giant fucking creatures. And then after all that, Hades transforms into this like monstrous tentacle creature because of whatever magic has been placed on him and has one even last final battle involved in all that, which is a Balhanoth uh, stat block. So really it was crazy with a lot of the Mordenkainen's and just a lot of really big, cool stomping creatures and just very much painted a picture of a, a very appropriate, like epic, you know, battle against giant monstrous foes is this uh, Greek mythology ending. So I thought that was a really cool climax. You know, it's just a pure like nitpicky thing. I would have just put that um, at the end to make it a little bit more easier and a little a little more easier to tell like how this all ends and where the climax is versus having it in the middle of the adventure. But Otherwise, for a one-shot, I think it's very well-paced. I think it's very well-organized. I did have problems with the actual introduction, I think, is a little hard to uh, get into and really wrap my head around how we get the actual party to this area, unless it is meant to be, hey, this is for, like, just we're going to make up level 12 characters and plop them right here at this lake, which if you're going to do that, then you have to tell me that, and then you could go the extra mile and provide me some cool like sample you know character sheets to run through that otherwise how are we going to get our characters which have probably run through something like storm king's thunder or you know prince of the apocalypse or out of the abyss or something and then take them to this lake that happens to have an entrance to the underworld uh, all right let's go over my pros and cons for tartarus journey into the underworld i'm going to stop on the map because it's the best <laughs> Pro, it's a well-constructed dungeon with a solid balance of exploration, combat, and socializing. And honestly, that goes a really long way with me when it comes to adventure design. I, I love a good dungeon crawl, and a good dungeon crawl has all of those factors played in. So the fact that we actually get our quest while in the dungeon, I think is actually pretty cool. But I think there needed to be a better way to just bring the characters to the front, which we'll get to that in my con. Uh, pro, lovely full-color dungeon map, including grid and gridless player versions. Holy crap, this is so amazing. And again, that, that goes a long way with me to have. If you're going to have a focus on the dungeon, you you have a really good map. It's It looks really fucking good, and I can't wait to, to play around with that. Pro, gorgeous layout filled with art, including focused slices of each area of the dungeon. So as I've been flipping through, you've seen it has a really which is a good idea like you can get away without using a lot of other art by doing this and honestly i think it's a good idea which is focusing on different rooms as you're talking about the rooms and it's a great way to utilize this gorgeous art that you've obviously commissioned uh and reuse it you know in multiple areas of your uh document you know we also have other art so it's not the only thing here but honestly i'm a big fan of this style of having this art so i don't have to flip back and forth now granted i'm reviewing the damn thing so i have a separate you know image file up so i can go back and forth but that's still very very handy to have i really like the way that's organized I, I wish a lot of adventures would do that assuming they have great map art to begin with uh and pro it utilizes unique and powerful monsters from warden kynan's tomb of foes that was actually pretty exciting because i'm bad about forgetting a lot about those monsters or the fact that I forget that, oh yeah, there is higher level monsters that have been added uh, in Mordenkainen's and of course is a higher level dungeon so we can actually use some of those cool monsters. So huge thumbs up to that. And I think that's a very much a Greek mythology thing too is to have just these horrible big monstrosities also. Um, cons, it lacks proper adventure hooks and a narrative setup and it kind of ends up just thrusting the DM and thus the players directly into this dungeon crawl. So it's still a very jarring introduction where I just didn't know how we made it from zero to we're standing at this lake, um, you know, overlook and because it's level 12 and, you know, if it's, if you're starting at level one or something, you can, you can jump the players into whatever. Cause it's like, that's your introduction, but level 12, you assume these players are well vested in their campaign. They've just completed something more than likely they've been adventuring in the forgotten realms. So how do we bring them from that into this situation? And I didn't see any attempt at that. Instead, it was just, Hey, this is the situation. And then, and then go. Um, but I do like that kind of twist where you actually maybe don't quite know what's going on until you get a little bit further into the dungeon. And then you actually get your quest because that helps satisfy that socialization role-playing uh, aspect of that dungeon uh, the other con which is a little nitpicky i admit because i do think most people who are going to be uh purchasing content on the dm's guild have probably obviously purchased uh those additional supplements like Ballo's guide to monsters and more kind of tomb of foes but i think it still goes above and beyond if a designer were to say Hey, if you don't have this kind of monster because you don't have that supplement, then you can use this with maybe this kind of tweak. So my other con is that there's no monster replacement suggestions 
in case anyone didn't have Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes. That just needs to be like a, almost a disclaimer put on this adventure. It's like, you really need to have that to get the most out of this adventure. Final verdict. Featuring a well-designed higher-level dungeon crawl, Tartarus' journey into the underworld proves that Greek mythology remains an excellent source of inspiration for heroic adventure. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewanson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. You can support my work, my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Christopher, Thomas, Captain Mike, Adam, Stan, Nathan, Alex, Cam, and William, and Gold Patrons, RPG, Papercrafts, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Dead Lizard, Lounge, Sam, Aras, Lumpy Spuds, Drome, Sklenia, Nick, Farty Mc, Butterbands, Blood, Angel, Vronis, Baboon, Baboon, Nathan, Fast Like a Tortoise, and James. Thank you all very much for your support.